Well, welcome to Jacob's Well, as you know it right now. Um, it's fleeting, it won't last, so uh, enjoy it. You know, there's something very singular about uh, Jacob's Well, as it is right now, because, you know, as I said, uh, it, it isn't what it once was, and it's not what it will be. I, three years ago, Jacob's Well was simply an idea that I was afraid to mention to my wife. Um, in six months from now, I would say what we think of as Jacob's Well is only going to be half of um, both who and where Jacob's Well is going to be. And that's something I'm going to want to be talking with you all about. And so a lot of changes, you know, why all the changes? Why all the hard work to do that? Why all the um, pain for those of us who really hate change and to deal with change? You know, why all that? And the answer is really pretty simple. It's, you know, because it matters. It really does. It's because it matters. Jacob's Well has mattered to us, and we truly believe that Jacob's Well is going to matter a lot to people, other people whom God has called for it to matter in their lives as well. That's a biggie for us. In this series, we've been looking at the fact that we as human beings, we, we want, in fact, we need things to matter in our lives. And God shares that. God wants things to matter in our lives as well. And in the New Testament of the Bible, that last about third of the Bible, there's a letter called the Ephesians. A man named Paul, who was one of the followers after Jesus, after Jesus' time, um, he wrote this letter and we, to a congregation in a place called Ephesus, uh, where it got, got its name. And he hits these points, these points about what really matters and how God is using that and how God is involved with all that. Now, he doesn't prove anything. Now, you can't prove these things. They're unprovable. Um, but he does propose some things, and he invites us to test drive his proposals. He says, these are the, this is what God set up, how God wants our lives and our world to matter and how we can work together to have that all happen. You've got to try it out and find out. Does it make sense? Does it work? When, when you start testing this, do the proposals that God offers actually start matching what your experience is? So you say, yeah, I think I could maybe trust that and maybe try it a little bit more. In this chapter today, um, uh, chapter 4, verse 1 through 16, we're just doing that little part. In fact, you've got a little card. Did someone give you one of these? All right, we've got that um, printed on here for you. I referred to it a couple of times, but that's something for you to have. Um, we've got a pretty clear picture of how the church fits into all this. And you'll notice if, if, you're, a, you know, if you're sharp, and I give you enough time to actually do it, that there's a couple of verses missing, 8 through 11, or 8 through 10, 8, 9, and 10. That's because Paul was a rambling speaker, rambling writer, and he has this little excursus that's a different point, and it really just doesn't fit at all. It's a segue that would distract from what we're talking about today. It'll have its own week in court, all right? Um, but in order to keep this straight on, you're just getting verses 1 through 7 and then uh, 11 through 16. But uh, so what, in short, what Paul is trying to tell us, what Paul is proposing that we would see how this matches with our experience and what could matter in life, he's saying something about the church. He's teaching us a lot about the church. In fact, if you look at the back side of your uh, Sunday papers, you're going to find outline, and that's where it all starts there, that the church is God's way of reaching all people. He says, I want, you to, I want you to wrestle with this and see if it wouldn't be true in your experience. The church is God's way of reaching all people. Um, and catch the vision, which we just experienced a week ago Saturday with a bunch of people, and I hope you all participate that in, in some time or another. Um, we talked about this notion that a Christ follower, someone who's trying to understand what Jesus is about and to understand God through Christ, a Christ follower without a church is an orphan. I, I mean that very seriously. And if, if you think back to week one of this series, we we're talking about the first chapter, where Paul says that we have all been adopted into God's family. How would you like to be adopted? Okay, so you're in an orphanage, right? And the administration of the orphanage comes up to you and says, good news, you've just been adopted. Great, when do I get to meet your fa my family? Oh, you don't. But by the way, your name is Smith now. You have a last name. You belong to these people. But they really don't want you to know where they are, and they don't want you to meet with them. Oh, great. You know, what kind of adoption is this? A Christ follower without a real live community to support them, encourage them, to plug them in, to find where they make a difference in that community and where that community can make a difference for them. Without that, that person's still an orphan. We need a real live, breathing, local 
community that we plug into. That's, that's so important. And um, that isn't just a promise for us that this community exists for us. It's God's plan. It's how God is trying to make sense of the world. Uh, thinking back to chapter 1, you'll find this on your outline. God's plan for the fullness of time is to gather up all things in Christ. To gather up all things in Christ, the body of Christ, the church. Um, to tie up these loose ends, to bring us all home. Now, I do have to throw a caveat in here, though, all right? When we talk about the church, and it's God's plan to use the church to plug all people into, I'm not trying to say that, um, you know, our understanding of the church is the only place for anybody to go. Therefore, anybody who's not in a Christian church, therefore, is outside of God's love or God's grace or, you know, God's, God's family. Now, that, that's something for God to work out. I don't have the answer to that question. In fact, I really trust that to God. Um, the church is definitely something bigger than any institution, any denomination that we could ever name and look at. God has ways of collecting people into communities where God's will is known and people are connected to God the way that God wants them to be. You know, that's great. I'm glad that God is bigger than anything that we can always understand of the church. But what I do know is that we have been called into this church, the church that gathers under the name of Jesus Christ, and it is our job to share that with other people to not necessarily you know, force other people to be in it, but to help other people experience it, to help people um, what benefit from the presence of the church in their lives. All right, It's up to God how God connects them. We, we aren't the judges of that. It is our job to be the church in the world, to offer that invitation, to, to let people see the Christ that we know, the, the community that we know, and the God that we have discovered through the church. So that's just kind of a... Um, a caveat behind all this, and I have a pretty good sneaking suspicion that's going to be one of the questions we'll be dealing with during that questionable series that's coming up starting a few more weeks from now. Now, you see, there's two things that God wants, two things that God wants and that are very clearly communicated in the book of Ephesians. One is to bring us all together, as we just said, in, under, through Christ. Uh, you know, God made real, cementing God's love and commitment to us for all time. But also, the other is to make a difference in our lives. God wants to bring us together, but God also wants to transform us, to, to make life matter, huh? to make this world matter. That's the other big thing. There's two sides what God's looking for. Expansion, reaching all people, pulling all people, and also intrusion, what, getting into our lives and messing them up for us and making them maybe more what they were supposed to be in the first place. God does not want to do one or the other. And frankly, while we, I think as human beings, have a tendency to think one way or the other, or try to always, we work really hard to figure out how these two parallel things go on. I don't think God sees a lot of incompatibility between those two. I think God really sees them as the same thing. Because God knows when God really works in our lives, it sends us out into the world. And when this world that, you know, this church that expands and begins to engulf us and embrace us, it begins to change our lives. I think God really sees them as two, what, you know, the, the two ends of the same spectrum. Of the same work that God is doing in our lives. So, you know, thus as a reflection of that, the church's growth is meant to be these two things. It's meant to be both inward and outward. The church's growth is meant to be both inward and outward. Um, I just want to turn on the, the end of this passage in Ephesians. Paul writes this. He says, We must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each of part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. All right? We, we are built up. We must grow up in every way. We have to knit the community together, and by doing that, we, we grow the body. All right? It's not, that's, that's expansion and the, um, and the intrusion of our lives, the inward and the outward. And this isn't just like a new notion. I mean, this is really how God set things in motion, how God was creating community and, and creating God's people from the very beginning. If you look at uh, the very, very early ancestry that uh, Christianity and Islam and Judaism all sprang from, we all trace ourselves back to Abram. Abraham, Abram, Abraham, all right? And, uh, and that's what really what Abraham was all about when he was claimed by God, when he was commissioned by God. And you'll find this next passage. Let, read this with me from Genesis chapter 12, very early uh, parts of the Bible. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, 
and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Now, this is our vision for the church, too, and it's a really, really interesting passage. So as soon as God gets a hold of Abraham, what does God tell him to do? Go. <laughs> this is this land that I'm going to show you. Don't worry. You don't know it. It's not going to be, you know, what you already had. It isn't the Jacob's well you know now, but that's where I want you to go. It's going to be leaving some things behind, but it's the place that I have you. I have called you to. And here's what really gets interesting, and you almost, you have to be Hebrew, really, to catch this, what, what's, been going, what's going on in this passage. But he says, I will make your name great this way. I will make your name great. Well, that sounds like self-aggrandizement, right? You know, I want to be made important. Jacob's well, we're going to respond to God's calling because we want the name Jacob's well to be great. But there's, there's something going on here in the Hebrew that we'd miss that Abraham, Abram, wouldn't have missed and any Jewish person wouldn't have missed. And that is, this whole story is pivotal in Abraham's name changing. It starts out as Abram, and it goes to Abraham. So he's addressing Abram, and you know what Abram means? Abram means father of greatness, or great father. Put those two together, however you want, great father. So God says, I'm going to make your name great. And Abraham says, what do you mean? My name is already great. You're not going to make my name great. That is literally my name. My name is Great Father. You don't have to do that to me. I already, that's who I am. But Abraham, the name that he's going to receive is father of a multitude, father of a, a great number of people, father of a multitude. Now, the, the subtext, the message that uh, Abraham is learning and all the people that draw their, you know, their lineage, their their faith connections to this Abraham long ago, the message that all of them are getting is, you want to really have a great name? It isn't in who you are, it's in what I make of you. It is what I do through you, all right? It isn't that your name is Great Father, it is that I will do great things in you. That's what it's all about. It's the same for us today, too. When God makes our name great, it isn't because Jacob's well has become important or Greg has become important or any of you has been, become important, but God has used us in great ways. God has done um, wonderful things in turning us into a multitude. See, we aren't great because of who we are, but because of how God's purposes are accomplished through us. If you look at the very top of your um, outline there, you'll see this verse, and this is a, a great verse. I put it at the top because, you know, if you're going to maybe memorize something from this part of chapter 4, this is probably the, the right line to do that. Um, you can read this with me. The gifts God gave were so people could enjoy them. Oh, no. It isn't that. The gifts God gave were to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. God has equipped us. God has given us gifts. God has you know, blessed us in order to, as he said to uh, Abraham, in order to be a blessing for other people. God has given us these gifts so we can be a blessing to the world, so that we could um, equip the saints, the saints, that just means God's people, the people who are struggling to wrestling with God, to help them be about the work of ministry, building up this body of Christ, building it up and building it out. Now, there is nothing wrong with enjoying uh, what God has given us. All right? That's a good thing. God wants you to enjoy what we are given. There's nothing wrong with benefited, benefited, can you say that word? I can't. Benefiting from it either. All right? But that isn't why God has given us those things. You know, whether that is referring to the community, maybe that's what you really love about Jacob's Well, maybe it's the music, maybe it's um, the uh, fresh understanding of God and faith that you receive here, maybe it's the coffee, uh, you know, whatever it might happen to be that you really love about Jacob's well, God doesn't mind that you enjoy it, and God doesn't mind that you benefit from it, but God didn't just give it to you or to us for that purpose. No, God gave it to us to build us up, yes, but also to build us out. It's something for us to share. It's something for us to give away, and as I've often said, I think we find that we really receive those gifts when we begin to give them away to other people. Um, here's an important rule of thumb in determining the greatness of a church one that I, I go by, and that is um, the greatness of a church is not determined by its seating capacity, you know, how many um, people we have sitting here on Sunday morning, but by its sending capacity. Not how many people God has gathered, but how much impact can God have to this community, this body of Christ? How much of the love of God can be experienced because Jacob's well exists? All right, that, that's the greatness of a church. 
You can have 1,000 people and have no impact. You can have 20 people and have enormous impact. Um, God would like to have everybody having enormous impact. That's what it would all be about. You know, in line with that, um, as we try to be a, a church that measures that, um, we care how many people are here on Sunday morning because every one of you is a real person. So the fact that you are here and you're accounted is important. But, but what we want to really do is to help you then take on this faith and share it with other people. And, you know, in order for us to kind of know how we're doing, we have this survey. And some of you have already done that. And uh, it's an anonymous survey, but it kind of, it's really to measure us, to see you tell us how you are doing, how you understand your faith, and that helps us know how we're matching some of our goals. Um, there's some of these at the table as you go out, I invite you to nab one and fill it out. It literally takes maybe three minutes to do. Um, and you can just leave it there. Uh, or otherwise, it's also going to be available to you online. It comes with a constant contact. You'll have a link where you can do it online. Um, it is anonymous, and please help us with this. It really helps us understand how we're doing because we want to be concerned about our sending capacity, not just uh, the seating capacity here. Now, in Ephesians chapter 4, this section that we're looking at today, um, I think it is an exciting part because it grounds us as a church, and it tells us that there's three ways um, to understand the, how great how a church is great. And the first is that a great church is clear about its oneness. And if we want to be a, clear, a great church, we need to be clear about our oneness. That's really a big one. The first um, six verses of chapter 4 are all about that. In fact, it talks about it in seven ways. And again, if you know anything about uh, Hebrew numerology, the number seven is very, very significant. It could be that Paul just happened to list seven things, but I would be willing to bet that he knew that this was the perfect number. Seven is the ultimate number, so he listed seven ways just to underline the point, um, something that we'd miss. He says that uh, we are to be one in body, we're to be one in spirit, in the hope of our calling. Um, there's one Lord, there's one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. All of these are the oneness of it. What he's really driving at isn't that we're one and that we always agree on everything, but that we are one in action that we unite as one body that's doing one thing, um, accomplishing each of us in our own ways, each of us according to our own gifts, each of us according to the personality, the experiences, the callings within that body that God has given us, but we unite and act in one way. United in these, we unite in these things, those seven things, we do not divide over them. We can have differences within them, but we nonetheless unite around all that. Um, and so it's our vision that drives us. And, um, in Sunday gatherings, we really try to use Sunday as a way to help us to do that, to see past differences and to see how we can unite over these things. In fact, um, at the very beginning of the worship service, when four or five of you are here on Sundays, this video runs every week. And I just want you to see it now because some of you have never seen it. <laughs> few sentences that are on that, we try to convey that what is this oneness, what is this vision that we all are a part of in our own unique ways. Uh, we have a core value. We have these lists of nine core values that Jacob Swell is a part of, and um, the one you'll see that on your, on your sheet is that we focus on the mission that unites, not the details that divide, all right, because we value unity and diversity. Those are not incompatible. Unity and diversity are very much a part of one another. A question that we should always be asking is, what are we going to be doing together now? What is it that we are all going to be doing together? It's an important question for Jacob Swell to be asking all the time. Um, the second thing that Ephesians talks about is that a great church is also clear that all of its people are gifted. All right? And we find this particularly in verses 7 um, and then 7 and 11. And there's that little excursus that I pulled out that's in the middle. And you can go take your Bible and read it at home later. But um, you see, we don't just need each other. 
in order to have X number of people because you've got to have so many people. No, we need each other because there are a lot of skills needed, a lot of gifts, experiences, personalities needed in order to make us whole and healthy. God has called us to do things that there is no way I could begin to do. There's no way that any one of us could begin to do. And uh, the more people we have and the more we value the way that each of us is uniquely gifted in God, um, the more able we are to do that. In fact, if you want to you know, find this here, um, on the second paragraph, let's just read that together, these first two verses, 7 and 11. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. And then it goes on and says, why? To equip the saints for the, as we already talked about. So all of us have been equipped in gifts. And those, those four things, those four gifts are just examples. He's just talking about the list goes on and on. I mean, there, there is a different variation on the gifts that God has uh, give, given us that is uh, unique to each and every one of us. Uh, that's an important thing to remember as well. So we, we try to remember that each of us is gifted. I play a very visible role here at Jacob's Well. You know, I'm the one who stands up in front of people and talks a lot. Dawn does that. Nate's up here singing a lot. That doesn't mean without, that we're particularly important. There's a difference between visibility or prominence and importance. There are other roles that may be very much behind the scenes that can be incredibly important. You know, if, if you are connected to Jacob's Well and you have found something life-changing because of it, whoever it is that connected you here is the most important person to you. It, we may never even know who that was. That's okay. That's how it works. I mean, you think of your human body. We have some very visible parts of our body um, that are not particularly important. And we have some incredibly important parts of our body that are completely invisible. It's the same way within the body of Christ. And so we have this core value that uh, everyone is a minister. We value every person's calling from Christ. And that's an important thing for us to remember and that guides a lot of our decisions every day. Um, a third thing, then, that uh, a great church needs to be clear about is that it is meant to grow. And we've talked about this already. But every church, in order to be great, needs to be clear that it was meant to grow. And you'll find that in this, the finishing verses there of this passage in Ephesians. Again, Paul, coincidence or not, mentions seven ways in which we're growing. He comes back to that theme in those four short verses, five short verses, I can count, five short verses, and mentions it seven times, just to prove that this is big, folks. I'm making a point here. Don't miss it, OK? So he underlines it that way. Um, our core value around this is that we must grow larger and smaller at the same time. God loves everybody. God wants to touch everybody's lives, all of our neighbors. And God would, you know, would like to have Jacob's Well be one of the vehicles of doing that. But as we grow larger, God doesn't want us to also become hollow or just superficial. So uh, we need to also, you know, it's the outward and the inward. We also need to grow smaller at the same time, maintain those connections within people. We use uh, group life as our primary way of doing that. That's why you know, we say the two things we really want you to do is we want you to come to worship, we want you to be a part of group life with us as well so that this community can be smaller at the same time. We value a worshiping community that is both meaningful, goes deep, and contagious. It, got ha it can't help but be shared with other people. So that's what we try to be about and how we try to guide ourselves in doing these things. Now, what I want to spend a couple of minutes sharing with you right now is a very practical way that we are living that out right now as a community. And that is our vision of being a congregation of multiple sites. Okay, this is not a, a new idea. Uh, before we ever gathered the very first time, this, this was the plan. This is how we wanted to be present in particularly South Minneapolis. This would be a, a congregation, a group of people, a community of Christ followers that would meet in multiple sites. Um, see, Jacob's Well isn't just here at Field. This is just where we began, all right? And there's nothing intrinsic to the fact that we are at Field. We are a people. We are not a place. We could meet anywhere, and we can meet in, in various places at the same time. So this is where we began and, uh, and where we will be expanding from. We really feel that for Jacob's Well's mission and its message and what people are really looking for and what we're offering, that the kind of size that we have here is probably a pretty healthy size. Two to 300 people um, you know, gathering at a time where you have enough people to do the stuff that you want to do and you can be effective. But it's not so huge that you know, you're anonymous forever. You, you don't get known and you aren't able to establish some community. So rather than just growing this and getting it bigger and bigger and finding a larger and larger auditorium, we so, said, well, can't we just replicate this? Can't we do it by having multiple services, um, you know, maybe on Sunday morning? And can't we do it by going to another place as well? 
And those are really different strategies. Adding another service here to accommodate people in this community to come to field, maybe at another time on Sunday morning, and then starting another worshiping community that's maybe a little bit further away is a completely separate issue, right? Because one of the things we know is that for most of us, we really like our community. There are some of you that drive quite a ways to come here, but a lot of you say, you know, I would really like to gather as a church with people that I see at the grocery store, at the club, uh, maybe I have my kids in school with, um, I see them at the coffee shop, those sorts of people. I want to bump into the same people. I want my community to have that kind of integrity and that kind of overlap. And we know that, uh, you know, while Jacob's Well uh, draws from a, a pretty wide range of places, that we're pretty clustered to right around a circle around this location. And uh, for instance, if you take a Hiawatha corridor, Highway 55, we pull a lot of people from right up near it, but you go to the other side, almost nobody's crosses Hiawatha to come here. So where could we find another community then that is very similar to who we are right now, culturally, and you know, expectations, the spiritual questions are asking, the things they're struggling with, they're very similar to here, so we don't have to reinvent everything. What we're doing here fits that other place, and we could duplicate this. We could expand this community, be a part of what God is trying to do with us. And we're thinking, you know, the other side of Hiawatha would be a great place to plant another embodiment of Jacob's Well. We've had a, a research team has been doing a ton of work on this over the last couple of months to um, understand, uh, you know, is, is that a right place to go? What would be the possible locations? What impact is it going to have on our staff and our budget and programs, all that kind of stuff? And they're doing a great job and are getting close to it. And um, you're going to be getting a lot of information about that from people. Um, but that's what we're working on. So what would change here? I mean, I, I think that's a real natural question to ask is if we were going to do that, and it does sound, I mean, I really believe it sounds like what God is asking us to do. God says, don't just keep this for yourself. I, I want you to share this. I want you to give it to other people as well. How will that affect us here? Well, frankly, not nearly as much as you might be thinking, thinking it will. The main impact that we'll have certainly over the long run is that it's going to enrich this community because we're going to be a part of something, uh, a body that is much larger and has more gifts and more, more people to share in what it's all about. Um, how we will do it in a technical sense is that, uh, you know, how we worship in series like this one, you know, it starts this week and it goes through five weeks of uh, Because It Matters and ends. What we'll do is, um, you know, offset those a week. So maybe I kick off this series here and Nate is leading the band here to, with the music and stuff like that. The next week, I go to the other location and I kick off that same series and Nate follows me and the person who was preaching at the other location, maybe Dawn, comes here and does week two. So you can see how that goes. So what we're able to do is we're able to um, lead worship. We're able to impact two communities at the same time with a very small addition in, in what it takes for us and resources to do it. Uh, we will need another worship leader. Nate will still be in charge of all the music. He's going to be um, you know, envisioning it, creating it, preparing, that preparing everything that we're doing, but there'll be another worship leader for the other place. Nate will switch back and forth. That other person will switch back and forth. None of us are going to go away. I'm sorry, you'll still see me. You know? Uh, and the same thing with the preaching. I'm not here every week right now. You know, Dawn is preaching. We'll probably, we'll, I'm sure, get another person into the mix. I guarantee you, in terms of worship leaders, in terms of other preachers, um, you know, the standards aren't going to change. We're going to have someone that matches who we are and what we're trying to be and probably is better in many ways than we are and, uh, you know, will be different and unique in their own ways. Um, it's only going to enrich who we are and what we do. In terms of children's ministries, Heidi will still be in charge of the whole thing, H2O for both campuses, um, but we'll have a dedicated person at each, at each location so that isn't changing week to week. I mean, I think it's okay for me to be here one week and there the other week and then be back. That works okay for us. Um, I think kids need a constant um, presence of who's leading that. Um, so that's kind of just a general overview of, of technically how we're intending that to work. And what we think is it really is able to um, give us a scale to then begin to do some things that it's just so hard for us to do as a community here. Um, Aaron Lay just is working so hard on a very, very part-time basis to do stuff with our youth. Um, hopefully it would pr it enable us to um, provide a much larger youth position, maybe something to help with group life, maybe uh, something to help us with our service projects in the community. Um, who knows, but it would give us the ability to, um, to expand and to enlarge what we're able to do and to be more intentional about the things. And, um, uh, make my time more available to concentrate on some of the things that would help me to um, lead Jacob's Well overall. So those are some of the things that we're looking at. Is it going to be a change? Yeah. It'll be a change. Um, is it going to be some work? Yeah. Uh, you folks are not going to be expected to set up and tear down the two sites. The people that go to the other site, that's their job, all right? 
If you decide to be a part of that site, that's, that's a totally separate decision on your part. Um, but things are going to change anyway, aren't they? I mean, we aren't who we began with. Uh, we started this when we first worshipped. We only knew that there's going to be about 30 people show up here. And all of you folks are here. I mean, that was change. Um, things will change. God wants it to change. God wants us to become who God is pointing us to. And I think that's going to be okay. What I would like you to do um, as the service ends is just to consider how you feel called in order to this. And uh, this isn't your only chance to think about it, but, but do be prayerful about it. And on your communication card, if you just want to say, I, I would, Greg, I'd be really willing to help with some of the ministries that would that help launch this new congregation. And um, just, you know, keep me in touch and uh, let me know how I could be useful in doing that, uh, and I'd be happy to do that. Just write on your um, on the back of your communication card, you know, support, support the second venue or something like that. And uh, we'll know that and we'll be in touch with you. Of course, we'll be in touch with everybody, but we'd love to know that you're ready to do that. If you feel that you're a person who's called to help start this and you want to be a part of what we call the launch team of people that we would start with to um, begin to move and to um, start the previewing of the service of this second location over the second half of the summer and then into the fall, we're hoping to begin weekly services in October. If you'd like to be a part of that, just write launch team on the back of yours. You're not signing up, you know, in blood on anything, but uh, we'll be in touch with you and make sure you get the information you would need to know to um, discern that a little bit further. The last thing on your uh, outline, just to let you know that I'm done, okay, um, is this. It's a tendency for us to find this place with our church, with our faith, whatever, where we think we make a deal with God. And God is going to deliver us what we want in our faith. And God is going to help us, you know, handle our lives the way we want them to be handled. And uh, it doesn't work that way. God's got something else in mind. What this feeling is, is it isn't the plan of Jacob's well to use God. We aren't going to use God to make our dreams come true. It is our plan to be used by God. It isn't Jacob's well's plan to use God, but to be used by God. We think God has called us here to give this away to other people and in doing that, discover how we can have it ourselves. Let's pray.